Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Now, chapter 15 closed with Jesus dead in a stone cold tomb and the hopes of all the disciples were dashed. Now, I want you to picture in your minds what they were going through right at this moment. And Jesus was in the tomb. They had been with Jesus for three years. They were convinced that he was the Messiah. But then Jesus was betrayed by Judas and he was given over to the Jewish authorities who gave, them, gave him over to Pontius Pilate, who then scourged him and crucified him. When he was arrested, all the disciples, not just Peter, all of them fled. They all forsook him. Then Peter, remember, denied him three times. As a matter of fact, he even called curses down in denying the Lord. Jesus, again, he was brutally beaten, he was scourged, and he was crucified, and then he was sealed in that stone-cold tomb. Imagine what they felt at that moment. What grief, what sorrow, what guilt, what shame. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, it talks about a kind of sorrow of people who have no hope. Sorrowing is people who have no hope. Jesus had told these guys many times that he would be killed, he would be buried, and then the third day he would rise from the grave. But they didn't believe it. And so they were sorrowing as those who had no hope. Jesus is in the tomb right now, but guess what? Sunday is coming, and that's what we're going to study this morning. The resurrection. Let's look in chapter 16. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James... And Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Forgot to pray. Let's pray. Father, give you thanks for your word this morning. We pray now that you would open our ears, open our eyes, that we would see Jesus crucified, buried, but also resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father, that position of power and authority. Lord Jesus, you rule and you reign, and we pray that you would rule and reign in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So it says, when the Sabbath was passed. Now, you know, in the Jewish calendar, the days went from evening and morning, or evening and the day. So it started, the Sabbath was ended on Saturday evening. And so this would have been Saturday evening. The Sabbath was passed. They went and they bought these spices. But very early, it says in verse 2, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, that is Sunday morning, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Now, we know from other gospel accounts that they set out when it was dark, but by the time they got there, the sun had risen. In verse 3, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. For it was very large. Now, it's important to note that these women didn't expect to find Jesus alive. They came to anoint a dead body with some spices, probably aloes and and myrrh, to prevent the putrefaction and decay of that body. So they were expecting a dead body when they got there. Now, some people say, you know, the resurrection account is just a product of wishful thinking on the part of the believers. Well, this shows that these women didn't expect him to be alive. They weren't wishfully thinking, were they? They were expecting him to be dead. And so they come and they say, well, who's going to roll away the stone? Now, these stones were circular, kind of like a a millstone is. And they were typically lodged in a downward sloping channel. And they'd roll it against the entrance of the tomb. Now, it's easy to roll a, a stone like that down, but it's very difficult to roll it back up. Some of these stones were very large. It says this one was. Could have been up to 2,000 pounds. And so these women could not do that without some help. But when they get there, they notice that the stone had already been rolled away. And we know that in Matthew's account of this, chapter 28, that an angel rolled it away and he was sitting on the stone. I, I, I love that picture. He just rolls it away and just kind of sitting there, you know, like, check this out. Now, he didn't roll it away to let Jesus out. We know in Jesus' glorified body, he could pass through walls and he could appear in different places. He rolled it away to let them in, to see that he was not there. 
And so it's rolled away. It was very large. And they went in. It says in verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. This is the angel. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Now, if you were to go to Jerusalem today, you would go out the north exit, the north gate of the city, which is called the Damascus Gate. And you go through a little Arab quarter there and you go up to what's known as the Garden Tomb. Now, the Garden Tomb is one of the sites they believe was the burial site of Jesus Christ. And I personally believe it, it was the burial site. The other one is uh, a Roman Catholic church now. And it's where Constantine's mother said that's where the burial site was. But we don't really, I don't really believe it was. But if you go to that site north of the Damascus Gate, the Garden Tomb, you walk in to the Garden Tomb and guess what? You turn to the right and there's the burial spot. Just like it's laid out right here in, in the Gospel. Now, this angel comes and, and he tells them this. He says, do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they've laid him. What a lucky angel to be able to come and to say this. To be able to tell them the first account that he was risen from the grave. And notice the contrast in what he said. He said, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. You're seeking a dead body. But he's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. In other words, he is alive. What a contrast that is. Jesus defeated the power of death. The power of death was crushed by the power of life in Christ Jesus. Jesus proved his power over the grave. And so this one fact of history that Jesus rose from the grave separates Jesus from every other person who ever lived is that he himself has power to lay down his life and power to take it up again. Now notice something in verse 7. He not only tells them that Jesus is alive, but he says, now go tell his disciples and Peter. I love this. God is so good. Do you remember what Peter told the Lord before he was arrested, before he was betrayed? Peter said, I, I tell you the truth, all of you will deny me. And, he, and Peter said, even if all deny you, I will not deny you. you remember it? And he, and he said it again even more forcefully after that. I will never deny you. And all of them said that. But in that time of testing... When Jesus was arrested and there were all those Roman soldiers there, 500 of them, Peter failed. He failed. He denied the Lord. He denied ever knowing Him. He even cursed and swore as he did that. And when the cock crowed and Peter realized what he had done, it says that he went out and wept bitterly. Now, I don't think any of the other disciples denied the Lord as badly as Peter did. But he is the only one that the angel of the Lord here singles out by name and says, go and tell Peter that Jesus is alive. And let this be an encouragement to you that when you fail the Lord, you may really mess up in your walk with the Lord. You may commit a sin worse than anybody you know. You may think, you know what? God is through with me. God must hate me because of what I've done. How can I face God now after what I've done to him? But just like Peter, God will single you out and he'll call you by name. And he'll say, I want you to come to me. Come and meet me. Just like he did with Peter. He wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you. God loves you, even if you fail him. Romans 5.20 tells us that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. You can put it another way. Where sin abounded, grace overflowed. That's God. God covers our sin with His grace. He's so good to us. His grace is so great. It's like a river that flows down to the lowest point. You know how water does that? It always flows to the lowest point. God's grace always does that in our lives. 
flows down to the lowest point, brings us up. God is so good. And so when you fail the Lord, remember the words of this angel. He says, go tell his disciples and Peter. And then put your name right there in Peter's place. You know, the disciples were completely bummed out at this point. Hopeless. But the resurrection will change everything in their lives. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves some things. Proves, number one, that Jesus himself is God. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then Jesus is just a man and nothing more. But Jesus was God because he rose from the grave. This separates him from every other religious leader. Separates him from Muhammad, from Krishna, from Buddha, and on and on it goes. Jesus rose from the grave. He's God. Number two, the resurrection proves that Jesus' death on the cross is the only way that we can be forgiven and have a personal relationship with God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's no other way. Jesus rose from the grave. He's God. And there is no other way to heaven except through him. The third thing the resurrection proves is this. That we too will rise from the grave. You and I are going to rise from the grave. Not just as spirit beings. We're going to rise in a body. A glorified body. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Paul's writing here. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we defeat the grave? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us the victory. And so death no longer has the sting that it once did. We are going to rise from the grave. And this has a tremendous implication for all of us. I was thinking about this for myself. You know what? I don't follow a dead leader. I follow a risen Lord. I don't have a religion. I have a relationship, a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I have eternal life right now. You know, sometimes we think about, you know, we're going to have eternal life after we die and then we live forever. We have eternal life now. Listen to what it says. John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has everlasting life already. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And so if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you already have everlasting life. Another thing is that all other religions are wrong. That's a tremendous statement today because there's a lot of people that say all religions are equal in value and all roads lead to God. Well, in a sense, all roads do lead to God because everyone is going to stand before God to be judged for their sins. But all other religions are man-made and they will not bring you to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can do that. So all other religions are wrong. And then the last thing that I was thinking about was this. What do I have to fear in my life? What is the worst thing that can happen to me? Well, somebody could put my lights out. Somebody could kill me. It's the worst thing that could happen to me. You know what? If somebody kills me, they're just going to usher me right into the presence of Jesus Christ. What do I have to fear? And yet, the devil will come to all of us and give us that fear of death. Jesus has taken it away. He's abolished the fear of death. What do we have to fear? He's risen from the grave and we too will rise. 
You know, my pastor in, in Albuquerque, whenever he does a funeral, he says, he looks at the, the coffin there and he thinks, lucky stiff. You know? <laughs> There's a guy, he's, he's gone to be with Jesus, you know. The resurrection has power for all of us. It has implications for all of us. Well, in verse 8, so when they went out quickly, or so they went out quickly, excuse me, and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Along the way, as they're running back to tell the disciples, they were so amazed and they were trembling that they didn't say anything to anyone on the way. They just ran all the way back. Now, when I was a new believer, I had a discussion with my brother about people who take the Bible literally. And he obviously thought it was something stupid to do, to take the Bible literally. And he was telling me about a cult of snake handlers in the, in the hills of Appalachia. They, basically, they start their church service with a lot of singing and dancing. And when the congregation is really whipped up into a frenzy and going wild, they bring out these rattlesnakes and they pass them around. And they do it because of what it says in verse 18 here. It says, they will take up serpents. And, you know, when I heard this from my brother, I had never heard it before. And I thought, this is kind of weird. You know, I, I was thinking of the, the deliverance, you know. <laughs> that must be what the worship band's playing up there. Where they're... And I knew in my heart that, that they were wrong to interpret that verse that way. But I didn't know what to say to my brother. And so what I did was I went to a church that was up the street from where my parents lived. And that particular Sunday, there was a guest preacher. And after the service, I went and I asked him about it. And I said, well, what about these snake handlers? And I pointed him to this verse. And he said, oh, that's just a late addition uh, in the book of Mark. He said, it's not in the original. And I said, well, I heard it was. And I said, if we're supposed to take the Bible literally then what am I going to say to my brother? And he said, well, it's like politics. You never get anywhere arguing about the Bible. And then he just kind of dismissed me. And that upset me because I wanted an answer. I wanted to know, is this God's word or not? Now, verses 9 through 20 are bracketed in many modern translations as not being in the original Greek manuscript. For example, some of your Bibles may say, the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. The fact is that these verses are not found in the two oldest Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, known as the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, which are the two oldest complete Greek manuscripts that we have, which date back to 325 to 340 A.D. However, nearly all other manuscripts of Mark do contain them. And, furthermore, many early Christian writers quote these verses in their writings. And we know that their writings predate those earliest manuscripts that we have. And so this shows that the early Christians knew it was there and accepted it. For example, there's a man named Papias, who is writing about 100 A.D. And he refers to Mark 16, verse 18. And I don't think he was handling rattlesnakes, you know, but... Another one is Justin Martyrs. He wrote a a thing called the, the Apology. In his first Apology, which was written 151 A.D., he quotes Mark 16, verse 20. Irenaeus, in his writing called Against Heresies, Written in 180 A.D., he quotes Mark 16, verse 13. And then a guy named Hippolytus, in his writing called Peri Charismatin, in 190 to 227 A.D., quotes Mark 16, verses 18 and 19. And so these early writers were writing of these verses before the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. And so I believe that this indeed is the Word of God that this indeed was in the original. And so I'm going to teach it as it is, as the word of God. So look in verse 9. So when he rose early on the first day of the week, 
he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. The first appearance of the Lord after the resurrection was to Mary Magdalene. Now this is another bit of evidence which proves that the resurrection is true. Because in that day, a woman's testimony was not considered valid in a court of law. And so, why would the New Testament writers put this in the Bible if it were not true? Now, you can read more about how Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene if you read in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. She thought he was the gardener. She didn't know it was Jesus at first. And it's a very touching scene as you read it of her love and devotion for Jesus Christ. How she's pouring out her heart to this gardener, she thought. Tell me where he is so that I can come and take him away. Now Jesus, it says that he had cast seven demons out of her. Can you imagine being possessed by seven devils? You know, Jesus said, he who has been forgiven much will love much. And it's quite obvious that she loved Jesus. You know, we have a lot to learn from these women of the Bible, don't we? in their love and devotion for Jesus Christ. Who were the first people at the tomb on resurrection morning? It's the women. Who were the last people at the cross? It was, it was the women. They were there. They were with Jesus. As close as they could get to Him. In verse 10, she went and told those who had been with Him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Three days after Jesus had been crucified, the disciples were still mourning and weeping. They were literally sobbing with convulsive sobs. Still, after three days. It's all right. <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens to your own phone? <laughs> That's okay. You can tell a lot about a person by the ringtone. <laughs> Who's that woman? I see that face back there, hiding behind that Bible. <laughs> anyway, Mary comes running in. They're weeping, they're convulsing, and tells them that Jesus is alive and that she had seen him. But they didn't believe her. Now in verse 12 it says, After that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Now this is a story of those two guys on the road to Emmaus. One's named Cleopas. And it says that he appeared to them in another form. This always kind of strikes me. In another form? What does that mean? Which well, just means at first he appeared to Mary Magdalene as a gardener. She didn't know he was the Lord. And now he appears to these guys as a fellow traveler. They didn't know it was the Lord. And they go and they tell the story to the rest of the believers, but they didn't believe them either. I should say to the rest of the disciples, because at that point they didn't believe. And then in verse 14, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Jesus didn't rebuke them for their fear or for forsaking him or for running away. He rebuked them for one thing only, for unbelief. You know, it's, it's not that they could not believe, it's that they would not believe. They were missing out on the joy of the resurrection. They were just in sobbing convulsions three days after he had been buried because they would not believe those who had seen Jesus alive. How do I know that Jesus is alive? How do you know that Jesus is alive? Well, we believe those people who saw him alive. These people who had seen him alive wrote these things down. This is the testimony in the Bible. And each one of these people, with the exception of John, and he was boiled in hot oil, each one of them gave their lives for what they wrote here. They said he's alive. Now, the, the Romans said, you can worship Jesus all you want, but you just have to take a pinch of incense and, and worship Caesar as well. And they said, we cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Jesus is alive. Caesar is not God. 
We will only worship Jesus and then they would throw him to the lions or they'd sew him up in, in animal skins and throw him out there or they'd have him go fight the gladiators. They died for what they wrote here. Now, would you die for something you knew to be a lie? I wouldn't. You might die for something that you thought was true but wasn't true. But you would not die for something you knew to be a lie. Something that you made up and propagated this lie. You wouldn't do it. And so that's one of the reasons why we know Jesus is alive. The other is, you know what? I've seen Jesus in other people. I've seen Jesus in your lives. I know that he changes people. But I've also seen Jesus in my life. I can say to people, I know that Jesus is alive because of what he has done in my life. He has changed me. I am not the same man I was at 24 years old when I gave my life to Jesus. He's changed me. He's radically changed me. And so Jesus is alive. You know, the only sin that God cannot forgive is the sin of unbelief. Jesus died for every sin imaginable. Every sin that you have ever done, past, present, or future. All that remains for us is to believe in Jesus Christ. But if we don't believe, we cannot be saved from our sins. Here he rebukes them for their unbelief. You know, if you're in the depths of sin, if you're in the depths of sorrow, if you have hopelessness in your own life, if you feel like life is kind of caving in on you and you can't get out, the only answer to your problem is a very simple answer, and that is that you must believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. It's simple. The answer is simple. It's Jesus. It's not Jesus and. It's not less than Jesus. It's Jesus and Jesus only. Jesus is alive. He can forgive your sins. He can give you victory over sin in your life. He can lead you and he can guide you. He can give you joy and peace. He is the answer to your problems. He doesn't just have the answer. He is the answer to your problems. And so Jesus comes and he rebukes them for their unbelief. But then he quickly moves on and look what he says. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. (laughs) You know it's true. Now that you know that Jesus is alive, now he says, go. Go and tell other people. You know, a born-again believer, someone who's received Christ and is born of the Spirit, is going to have an inner desire to share the gospel with other people. But sometimes, you know what? We just don't know what to say. I don't know what to tell people. But here, in the Bible, God will tell us what to say. Paul kept it so simple. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15.3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. That number one, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Number two, that he was buried. Number three, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's a pretty simple thing. He died for our sins, he was buried, and the third day later he rose from the grave. What a simple message to bring to people. You know, the gospel is called the good news. The devil will tell us all day long, that's bad news. Nobody wants to hear that. But you know what? Every person is made to know that truth. We are made in the image of God to know God personally. And so every person has that that capacity to know Him and in some way has that desire to know God. And they may be trying to find that or fulfill that in other things, but everybody, deep down, has that capacity and desire to know God. And so he says, go and preach the good news that Christ died for our sins, that He was buried and the third day later He rose from the grave. As you read through the book of Acts, you see the disciples going and speaking those three things consistently every time they preach the gospel. That Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, that he rose again. You'll see it in all of their preaching. But he says, go into all the world now. He had sent them out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, remember? But now he's sending them beyond the borders of Israel all the way to the ends of the earth. Listen to what he said to them in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the commission was to go out to the end of the earth all the way. 
But you know what? The early church didn't go out to the end of the earth straight away. They kind of hung around Jerusalem for a few years. They were just tightly knit together right there. Perhaps it was for fear. Until Acts chapter 8, when Stephen, this is right after Stephen was martyred, and there was a great persecution that broke out against the church, where Saul of Tarsus was taking Christians and, and he was arresting them and putting them to death. Then it says they were scattered into Judea and Samaria. And I find it interesting when they were scattered, this is what they did. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere and preached the word. So in other words, as they went, they preached. It's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes we think, okay, I've got to go preach the word. That means I have to go down to the town center and I have to sit on a soapbox and I have to preach. That's one way of doing it, but that's not the only way. As they went, they preached the word. As we go, we preach the word. So as you go to Sainsbury's to buy your bread and you check out at the till, you've got a gospel track in your back pocket and you just give it to the person at the till. God bless you. Have a good day. As you go, you go to school. You're meeting with people all the time. They say, well, what did you do last weekend? Oh, nothing. Well, you could say, well, you know, I went to church and I heard a message about the resurrection. Do you want to hear it? What? You, you go to church? I didn't know that. Or you're at work. When I first became a Christian, at that time I was a tennis coach. And prior to becoming a Christian, I hated coaching tennis. <laughs> I thought, you know, this is so boring. I'm just teaching little bratty kids and old ladies who can't learn this game, you know. But God showed me that, you know what, that's your ministry. And so what I started doing was I got my diary out and I started praying through all the people that I would meet on that day. And this lifted him up before God's throne. Lord, touch this person. Give me an opportunity, Lord, to share the gospel with them. And so we'd be... Playing our game, you know, I'd be teaching them how to play tennis and it's quite hot there, so we'd stop and have a drink of water. And I'd just say, do you, do you, do you know Jesus Christ? You know, or I'd say, you know what, uh, do you ever go to church? You know, that's kind of common ground with people, you know, rather than just jumping right in. Are you, are you, do you know that you're a sinner going to hell, you know, but, but you could just say, <laughs> you know, but you can, you can develop some common ground and then swing to the spiritual. You know, and you don't have to be stupid about it. You know that racket sort of looks like, it reminds me of the cross. You know? that's, that's ridiculous. But, but there are ways of doing it. And, and if you ask God, show me, Lord, how I can be a witness wherever I am. You know, we think we have to go out of our way to share the gospel. Sometimes God will do that. But other times, it's just on the way, wherever we're going. That's our ministry. You're all called into the ministry. Wherever you go. And you're a witness for Jesus Christ. And so, you know, those people that I started to talk to, some of them came to Christ. With some of them, I actually started a Bible study in my little pro shop there near the tennis courts. God just started doing miraculous things, wonderful things. And people were getting saved. And it wasn't because I'm something great as an evangelist. I'm not. But just bringing them before the Lord, talking to them about Jesus, just being faithful to do what he says to do here. Be a witness. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, every creature doesn't mean, you know, you have to go to preach to the birds. (laughs) I said that to the kids yesterday, you know. Preach the gospel to every creature. What? To the birds, you know? To the monkeys? No, no, no. It means all creation. To everyone, everywhere. Wherever you go. And so, verse 16 He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, Jesus is not saying that you need to be baptized in water to be saved. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Assuredly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Didn't say, okay, now um, get down from that cross, be baptized, and then get back up there. No. He was saved the moment that he put his faith in Jesus Christ. 150 times in the New Testament, it says that we are saved by faith. Listen to this, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. That we are saved by grace through faith, and that's not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved by faith alone, plus or minus nothing. Faith, believing in Jesus Christ. And so, baptism doesn't save, but it is what we do once we are saved. And so, a person who is saved will go into the waters of baptism if they can. Some people can't. Maybe they're too sick or whatnot. Maybe they're just extenuating circumstances and they die. But if a person is unwilling to be baptized, and say, they say they're a Christian, they're unwilling to be baptized, then you have to wonder if they're really a disciple of Jesus Christ because they're disobeying a known commandment of God. And so notice the reverse here. He says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, it doesn't say he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. The common requirement here is belief in both of those statements. We're saved by faith, belief. And just think of it. Just think of it. Just by believing, you're saved. How wonderful. How wonderful. He didn't say, okay, go out and you have to do all these things. You have to be religious. You have to give to charity. You have to bow three times a day to Mecca. No. Just by believing in Jesus Christ, you're saved from your sins. How wonderful. And then he says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. These signs will follow those who believe. This is a very important thing that he says here. He didn't say that believers should follow signs. A lot of believers today are being duped by con artists on television, on the internet, who advertise miracle shows. Come and check out this miracle. This is the power of God at work. From 6 to 8 on Wednesday night, he's going to work in this box at this particular time. You watch, you see. A lot of believers are being duped. You know, how can we box God in? Jesus said the Spirit is is like the wind. You, You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's come from or where it's going. We can't box God into our little formulas. Jesus is saying here that as believers go into all the world to preach the gospel, God will confirm the preaching of his word through the accompanying miraculous signs. He says they'll cast out demons. Yes, believers will cast out demons. Not out of other believers. Christians cannot be demon possessed. He's talking about casting demons out of unbelievers. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel. And a demon possessed girl followed them and kept crying out. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she had it right, but she's demon possessed. And she was really interrupting what they were doing there. And so after a few days of this, Paul got annoyed and he just turned around and he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the Spirit came out. And there you have it. Casting out demons. This happens all the time. If you read about the Gospel for Asia missionaries in India, they are seeing this happen all the time. Speaking with new tongues. Acts chapter 2. Remember it says that when the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost, they spoke with new tongues. And those Galilean believers there were speaking in the language of all those different Jews from all the nations uh, represented there. And they could hear them in their own tongues. They were speaking with new tongues. It says that they would take up serpents. And we just talked about you know the rattlesnake thing. That was, that's bogus. But Acts chapter 28, Paul landed on Malta and he was building a fire there on the beach. And as he's getting some firewood, a viper came out of the firewood and latched onto his hand. And so he just kind of shakes it off into the fire and went about his business. And all the Maltese people thought, he must be a god if he can do that. But it didn't hurt him. Now, it says also, drink anything deadly. It will by no means hurt them. Now, I heard of a pastor who challenged his elder board to drink poison if they had enough faith. 
Well, apparently, some of them didn't have enough faith. And he got charged with manslaughter. (laughs) You know what? We are not to test the Lord like that. We are not to test the Lord. This is what the devil did with Jesus. Remember, he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple and he said, If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down from here. He said, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. We're not to test the Lord like that. And so, if we are never to intentionally put ourselves in danger to test God. But he says, laying hands on the sick and they will recover. Now in Acts chapter 4, I want to turn there just for a moment as we close. In verse 24, it says, So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. This is one of the uh, effects of being filled with the Spirit of God that you speak with boldness. We're going to talk about that tonight at the tabernacle. But I want you to notice what he says. Lord, stretch out your hand to heal. That miracles will be done in your name. And I I was thinking about this for our town. I so want us to grow in our knowledge of God's word. I want every one of you to leave here with a piece of meat from the word of God to take home that you can chew on the whole week. But I also pray that God would pour out his power and show miraculous signs and wonders to confirm the word of God. I want God to show his power in healing people and casting out demons, laying hands on the sick, you know, and and these kind of things. I want that for you, for me, for this town, that God would show his mighty power. If you're sick here today and and you would like prayer, we're going to be praying for people at the end so you can come up and we will lay our hands on you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. But may he pour out his spirit upon us in such a way. Let's finish. Look at the last two verses. Now then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down. Now a high priest of the Jews could never sit down when he went into the temple to minister. His work was never finished. But Jesus, as our high priest, when he ascended into heaven, into the temple of God, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. His work was completed. When Jesus died on the cross, you remember what he said? It is finished. To telestai, paid in full, complete. The sacrifice, once for all, has been finished. And so he sits down And what he's doing there now at the right hand of the Father is he is interceding for us. So he looks at me. He looks at you. And he he sees that we sin sometimes. We fail. He says, Father, Doug sin there. You've seen that. Don't hold it against him, Father. He's mine. Put that on my account. Put that under my blood. It'll wash it clean. And so that's what he's doing at the right hand of the Father, always interceding for us, interceding his blood, his sacrifice for us. And when they went out and preached everywhere, oh, sorry, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. The Lord was working with them. I think this is one of the most comforting verses I know because. I never want to do anything without that conscious presence of God in my life. Whatever it is, whether you're a tennis teacher, whether you are a a school teacher, a musician, wherever you go, you want God right there working with you. He is working with us. We are never alone. 
He goes with us wherever we go. God proved that Jesus Christ is alive. By the witnesses here. He proved it. Jesus is alive. He's given us the good news to go and tell to everybody. And He's with us wherever we go. And the work that we do for Him is never going to be in vain. It's always going to be rewarded. Isn't it wonderful what God's done for us? Let's pray. Father, we give You thanks for Your Word today. We thank You, Lord, for how You love us. Lord, how you draw us to yourself. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of everlasting life through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us wherever we go, that we are never alone. We thank you, Lord, that our work is not in vain in the Lord. It has purpose. It has meaning. We thank you for that, Jesus. Lord, we offer ourselves to you As we sang this morning, I surrender all. We don't hold anything back, Lord. Would you take us? Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you use us, Lord, this week to share the gospel with other people? To share this good news, Lord. Lord, we see how other people do it, but perhaps that's not the way you want us to do it. And I pray that you would show each one of us individually how we can take part in sharing the good news with other people. Father, we want to. Just show us how, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.